So good afternoon. Welcome to session 3A, Law, Liberty, and Disobedience. Uh, we are grateful to our four presenters this afternoon and especially grateful to our featured respondents, respondent, Dr. M. Kathleen Cabany. Dr. Cabany is the Daryl and Juliet Libby Professor at Boston College, a position that includes appointments in both the theology department and the law school. She's the chair of the board of trustees of the Journal of Religion Ethics, and has been the president of the Society of Christian Ethics, as well as an editorial board member for the American Journal of Jurisprudence, the Journal of Religious Ethics, the Journal of Law and Religion, and the Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics. She's the author of more than 100 articles and essays and four books, including Laws, Virtues, Fostering Autonomy and Solidarity in American Society, A Culture of Engagement, Law, Religion, and Morality, Prophecy Without Contempt, Religious Discourse in the Public Square, and Ethics at the Edges of Law, Christian Moralists and American Legal Thought. And she was the 2018-2019 Carrie and Ann McGuire Chair in Ethics and American History at the Kluge Center of the Library of Congress. So welcome, Dr. Kaveny. Before we begin, I would like to quickly describe the format of our session. The four presenters will offer their papers and Dr. Kaveny will then provide a response to the four presenters. And then we will open up the, dis the discussion to questions from the audience with any remaining time that we might have. To ask a question, I ask that you please use the raise hand function within the reactions tab on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you really don't like speaking in public, you're welcome to chat me directly and send me your question and I'll ask it on your behalf. So without further ado, we'll introduce our first speaker. Danny Ballin is a first year PhD student in the graduate division of religion at Emory University in American Religious Cultures track. His research interests include American religious history, race, religion, and sexuality, and religion and politics in the US. Prior to pursuing doctoral training in religion, Danny was a practicing attorney in Southern California, where he specialized in public interest litigation and corporate law. Danny will be presenting a paper entitled, Religion as the Most Favored Nation, COVID-19 and the First Amendment at the Supreme Court. Danny. Zach, thank you for that introduction. And um, I have some slides, but I don't know that I have permission to share. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, great to see everybody. Uh, well, thank you uh, for that introduction, Zach. <clears throat> and. Uh, to everybody for being here this afternoon. I see some familiar faces in the audience and so it's always uh, nice to have. Um, on this theme of the conference of religion and pandemic, thinking about the ways that religion has been impacted and has and is changing through this pandemic moment, I wanna offer some reflections um, and observations about how the law of religious liberty is changing uh, through this pandemic. Now, I'll do that by <clears throat> telling the story of religious liberty and the pandemic at the Supreme Court through the lens of these three cases. The first is South Bay Pentecostal Church versus Newsom, a challenge to California's occupancy limits on indoor religious gatherings, which at the time the court decided the case limited attendance to 25% of fire code capacity or a maximum of 100 people, subject to additional public health measures like masking and social distancing. The second case is Calvary Chapel versus Sislak, a challenge to Nevada's regulation of religious gatherings, which capped in-person attendance to 50 people, regardless of building size, even as the state allowed many commercial entities, including casinos, to operate at 50% capacity. And the third is Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn, New York versus Cuomo, which challenged New York restrictions on houses of worship and in areas experiencing COVID-19 outbreaks limiting in-person attendance in the hardest hit areas to 10 or 25 people, depending on the area's proximity to the outbreak. <clears throat> Again, without regard to any particular building size, while essentially allowing, uh, well, allowing essential businesses like grocery stores, manufacturing and transportation facilities to operate without any occupancy limits. Each of these cases were brought by conservative religious groups. Pentecostals, Evangelicals, Catholics, and Orthodox Jews, claiming violations of their constitutional right to religious freedom under the First Amendment to the US Constitution. That amendment states in relevant part, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. 
In each of these cases, the religious claimants argue that the government has violated their religious freedom by discriminating against religious actors and activities in favor of secular ones. At the heart of these disputes is a technical legal question under governing precedent, Employment Division versus Smith, whether the restrictions at issue are neutral laws of general applicability, such that upon a First Amendment challenge, they are subject only to the deferential rational basis review standard, which is deferential to lawmakers, or instead, whether the religious, uh, whether the regulations discriminate against religion, such that a more searching judicial inquiry, strict scrutiny is required. It sounds like an arcane legal distinction to non-lawyers, but in constitutional litigation, uh, the success of a case often rises or falls with the applicable standard of review. So a lot is at stake for these litigants. Inherent within this technical legal question though, are two more basic subsidiary questions around which I wanna organize my discussion. The first is, <clears throat> what is the appropriate comparator for purposes of this analysis? In other words, what is the comparable secular conduct or entity for the purposes of measuring discrimination? And second, who gets to decide, judges or lawmakers? The cases I highlight here propose competing approaches to these questions with profound implications for the future of religious liberty, and I argue the future of minority rights. So on to the first of our cases. On May 29, 2020, the court in a 5-4 decision rejected South Bay Pentecostal's challenge to California's restrictions, with Chief Justice John Roberts joining the four more liberal justices on the court to form a majority. In his concurring opinion, the Chief Justice explained that although California's guidelines place restrictions on places of worship, those restrictions appear consistent with the free exercise clause of the First Amendment because similar or more severe restrictions apply to comparable secular gatherings, including lectures, concerts, and movie theaters, where large groups of people gather in close proximity for extended periods of time, exempting or treating more leniently only dissimilar activities in which people neither congregate in large groups nor remain in close proximity for extended periods. So back to those <clears throat> two questions I posed for this discussion, uh, Chief Justice Roberts makes a comparison between churches and museums and movie theaters, evincing a classically conservative legal posture of judicial restraint and legislative deference promoted by conservative legal thinkers in the 1980s and 90s, including uh, Justice Antonin Scalia, Roberts wrote, and this is the quote in front of you. The precise question of when restrictions on particular social activities should be lifted during the pandemic is a dynamic and fact intensive matter subject to reasonable disagreement. Our constitution principally entrusts the safety and the health of the people to the politically accountable officials of the states to guard and protect. When those officials undertake to act in areas fraught with medical and scientific uncertainty, they should not be subject to second guessing by an unelected federal judiciary. So here we see the Chief Justice answering the second of those questions, uh, deferring to the judgment of elected officials and public health experts. This brings us to our second case. On July 24th, 2020, the court reached a similar result in Calvary Chapel, the Nevada case, again by the same flight for margin, but this time over the objection of two well-reasoned and vigorous dissents. The first was by Justice Sam Alito, who painstakingly and persuasively throughout the implications of the crass commercial favoritism present in Nevada's regulatory regime, which Alito explained, allowed thousands to gather to drink and gamble at casinos while limiting religious gatherings to 50 people, regardless of the size of the facility and the measures adopted to prevent the spread of the virus. <clears throat> and so what you see in front of you uh, is an image that's in the record of the case that uh, purportedly was taken during opening weekend when the casinos were, were reopened. And you see dozens and maybe hundreds of people in close proximity without masks um, that can, might help explain to elicit what, uh, what elicited the response of the claimants in this case. More importantly for our purposes though, is the, is the dissent by Justice Brett Kavanaugh, which proposed a legal test for religious liberty claims to counter the approach set forth by the Chief Justice in South Bay Pentecostal. Drawing on the work of legal scholar Douglas Laycock, Kavanaugh offered a straightforward test providing religion, quote, something analogous to most favored nation status. Most favored nation status is a term in international economic and political relations under which the recipient of this status uh, or treatment must be afforded equal privileges as those enjoyed by the most favored nation. Under this test, courts faced with religious liberty claims such as these ask only two questions. First, does the law create a favored or exempt class of organizations? And if so, do religious organizations fall outside of that class? And second, if the religious organization is not part of the favored group, has the government provided a sufficient justification 
for the differential treatment of, and disfavoring of religion. Applying this test, Kavanaugh concluded, the Nevada occupancy limits were unconstitutional because they treated indoor religious gatherings less favorably than the most favored secular analogs like casinos, and because the government had not offered a compelling reason justifying the deferential treatment. <clears throat> Some background here might be helpful. The most favored nation approach to the First Amendment has been defended on the grounds that it ties the interests of religious minorities to the interests of the most powerful and politically connected secular actors. The paradigmatic case for this approach was a 1999 case in which Muslim police officers successfully challenged on religious freedom grounds, a requirement that all officers shave their beards in violation of the plaintiff officer's religious beliefs. In an opinion authored by then Judge Alito on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, the court held that the officers were entitled to a religious exemption under the free exercise clause because the department offered an exemption for secular reasons to officers who grew out their bids for medical reasons. In the pandemic context, the most favored nation approach has a surface level appeal. It ostensibly removes judges from the Solomonic task of deciding whether houses of worship are more like movie theaters and lectures, or instead more like grocery stores and factories. Under this approach, theoretically, courts merely adopt the default position of comparing religion to the most favored secular conduct or entity, i.e. to the secular conduct or entity exempted from the law the religious claimant challenges. And that default position is set by elected officials in the choices they make to exempt secular actors in conduct from otherwise facially neutral and generally applicable laws. Of course, the reality is that this approach merely begs the question of what the relevant secular analog is, and again places judges in the position of second guessing lawmakers on that question. And so we see this even in Justice Kavanaugh's dissent, where he compared uh, churches to casinos, and, and that might be a compelling justification, but uh, the state of Nevada would dispute that comparison. More fundamentally, at the heart of this approach is a paradox. It demands in the name of liberty that governments exercise the fullest extent of their powers in every instance or subject themselves to endless claims for religious exemptions. To put this in perspective, consider that the remaining pandemic related religious liber liberty cases on the court's docket include not only challenges to occupancy limits on houses of worship, but also to mask mandates and to restrictions on singing and chanting indoors with at least one lower court in joining Colorado's mask mandate as applied to in-person religious gatherings because the government allows exemptions to the requirement in at least some secular settings like restaurants. Despite these conceptual limitations, the court appears to have adopted Kavanaugh's most favored nation approach in the third of our cases, Roman Catholic diocese in which the court on November 25th, 2020, issued a decision suspending New York's regulations on the eve of the Thanksgiving holiday as the country was in the throes of a third wave of the virus and public health experts pleaded with the nation to refrain from travel and large gatherings. Unlike prior regulations that had come before the court, New York had attempted to tailor its restrictions more narrowly by focusing restrictions around affected clusters of cases rather than issuing across the board rules for the entire state. Further, as noted in Justice Sotomayor's dissent, New York had singled out houses of worship for preferential treatment relative to analogous secular activities, according to the state, like movie theaters and museums, which unlike houses of worship were prohibited from operating indoors altogether. Nonetheless, the court in a 5-4 decision enjoined the restrictions under strict scrutiny, which the court held applied because the state did not similarly restrict in-person occupancy at essential businesses, including big box grocery stores, retailers, office buildings, and factories. This marked a stark reversal from the court's holding and reasoning in South Bay Pentecostal just six months earlier. It also marked the first occasion the public witnessed the influence of the appointment of Justice Amy Coney Barrett just weeks earlier to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg who passed away in September. This shift from South Bay Pentecostal to Roman Catholic diocese, I argue, may present one of the more enduring transformations in the law to result from the COVID-19 pandemic namely the triumph of the most favored nation theory of religious liberty with a majority of the justices on the court and in religious conservatives political imagination. Under this view, the government has generally violated a party's right to religious freedom, so long as that party can identify any instance of comparable secular conduct receiving more favorable treatment. Support for this conception of religious liberty has been building at the court since at least 2014, when the court decided Burwell versus Hobby Lobby in which the court held that under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the federal government could not compel a closely held for-profit co corporation to purchase contraceptive coverage for its employees, 
in part because the fact that the government accommodated or exempted religious nonprofits undercut the government's position the application of the rule to religious for-profits was necessary to further the government's asserted interest in providing women access to seamless integrated health care. This view reemerged in 2018 in Masterpiece Cake Shop, where the court on narrow grounds found in favor of a baker refusing to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex couple for religious reasons. In that case, a few of the justices took the view that Colorado's anti-discrimination law unconstitutionally discriminates against religion in violation of the First Amendment because the law extends protection from discrimination to customers who are gay or lesbian, but does not similarly protect customers with anti-LGBTQ religious views. Most recently, this theory of religious freedom came to the fore in Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, a case currently pending at the court. <clears throat> in which Catholic social services challenges the city's exclusion of the agency from government contracts for foster care services because the agency will not commit to the city's non-discrimination policy, which prohibits discrimination against LGBTQ foster parents. Appealing to most favored nation rhetoric, the agency claims religious discrimination because the city's policies contain secular exemptions, appoint the city disputes, for example, allowing agencies to consider factors such as race and disability when placing children with foster families. To be clear, this conception of religious freedom is not universally shared, even by those with deep religious commitments. The contours of religious freedom and its application have always been contested, and the pandemic is no exception. Further, church state scholars point out that courts applying the most favored nation approach run the risk of violating the second prong of the First Amendment's promise of religious freedom, the Establishment Clause, by privileging religion over non-religion in violation of the Constitution's guarantee of religious neutrality. <clears throat> One stark example of this sort of religious preferentialism comes through in a separate set of cases working their way through the courts, in which religious K-12 schools challenge on First Amendment grounds local orders prohibiting in-person instruction. In one recent case, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals enjoined an Ohio County's order of this nature as applied to religious schools, despite the fact that the order shut down both secular and religious K-12 schools because the order did not shut down, quote, comparable secular facilities like preschools and daycare centers. In the end, the jurisprudential shift I trace here may largely be inconsequential to how pandemic era regulation of religion actually plays out on the ground. Every weekend, thousands of people around the country continue to gather in congregational settings, regardless of what state and local health measures might allow or prohibit. At the same time, thousands of people have chosen not to gather in person, despite and sometimes because of their religious leaders' defiance of public health measures. Moreover, the doctrinal shift might not have been necessary to achieve the same result. <clears throat> Arguably, the most arbitrary and draconian of restrictions on religion could have been struck down even under rational basis review. For example, one might argue that capping attendance in houses of worship without regard to whether it is a storefront or a cathedral is irrational. Conversely, even under the heightened standard of strict scrutiny in the most dire of circumstances, restrictions on religion may still be upheld as they were in California when hospital, hospitals were operating at 0% ICU capacity. And I should say, uh, I was referring to the lower court opinions and hours after I turned in this paper, the Supreme Court overturned uh, those decisions. Nonetheless, I fear the shift I trace here today, a move towards what some might call, quote, religious anti-liberalism may stay with us even long after this pandemic has passed with dangerous consequences. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. Uh, very, very much appreciated. Our next presenter is Anthony Harrison. Anthony is a PhD candidate at Boston College studying theological ethics. Having worked in education and ministry, his scholarship exhibits an interdisciplinary and ecumenical approach. His research interests include virtue ethics, restorative justice, and ethics of civil disobedience. Anthony will be presenting his paper entitled Individual Liberty and the Common Good. COVID-19 orders and civil disobedience. Anthony. Thank you, Zach, for the introduction. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm uh, excited that even during a pandemic, we can uh, get together to share ideas and talk about our papers and our scholarship. So thank you all. In responding to the threat of COVID-19, mayors and governors have issued emergency orders concerning travel restrictions, the wearing of facial coverings, and gathering limits in public spaces. <clears throat> 
This has prompted vocal contingents to decry such orders as un-American breaches of liberty. Mask mandates and gathering restrictions that impact religious services have been called out especially as attacks on individual liberty and religious freedom respectively. Because of this, we've seen brazen violations to these emergency orders committed out of concern for individual liberty and religious freedom. Citizens have gone about their lives without masks and accosted those who criticize them. Pastors have continued holding religious services despite the danger these super spreader events pose to their congregants. For these citizens and religious leaders, concerns of public safety and the common good are subordinate to the moral goods of individual liberty and religious expression. This paper will consider the willful violations of COVID-19 emergency orders as test cases for the boundaries of morally justified civil disobedience. Drawing on Thomistic perspectives on the justness of law, the bounds of legitimate civil disobedience, the room for epikaia or equitable action, and the discernment that that requires, it will be argued that the violation of such mandates do not meet the criteria for valid civil disobedience. Citizens who willfully violate mask mandates and gathering restrictions are often claiming that such policies and laws are unjust. This begs the question of how ought we to adjudicate such a claim? How do we evaluate the laws we are called to obey? Without a clear definition or method, the way is open for anyone to claim that a law is unjust, freeing themselves of its authority. In responding to the claims of anti-maskers and pastors holding large services during a pandemic, I turn to Aquinas' writings on human law. In reflecting on the quality of human law, Aquinas cites Isidore of Seville in delineating at least three basic characteristics of just law. A law should be reasonable. It should demonstrate a degree of internal coherence and logical consistency. Law serves as a means of teaching and discipline, which depends first on the order of reason. Second, human law also, quote, fosters religion. Aquinas worked within a teleological framework that asserted that all acts should lead us to our ultimate end, which is union with God. In this way, human law should implicitly bring us to virtue and closeness to God. In the interest of our modern American sensibilities, I would reframe this condition as not infringing upon religion. And lastly, a law should, quote, further the common weal, end quote, or promote the common good. In my view, local and state policies on masks, social distancing, and gathering limits meet the first and third conditions. It is reasonable that a community would take measures intended to reduce the spread of a communicable virus. Now that we are a year into the pandemic, we now know that such policies are evidence-based and scientifically proven to be effective for bringing down cases and deaths. The purpose of such policies fulfills the third condition. They are taken out of concern for public safety and the common good. A commitment to the common good should lead us to prioritize the needs of our neighbors and their safety. These take greater precedence over personal preference. It is this second quality of just human law, the fostering of religion or the not infringing upon it, that pastors could appeal to, to in order to justify violating gathering restrictions for indoor religious services. It seems self-evident. Does not restricting gatherings for religious uh, worship in of itself impeding religion? A number of justices on the Supreme Court have taken that view, specifically for targeted restrictions on religious services, as opposed to general restrictions that equally apply to all public places. However, their legal arguments come with some qualifiers. In ruling against California's mandates, they prohibited blanket bans on religious worship and targeted restrictions that treat religious services specifically. They have not held that religious freedom precludes any restrictions whatsoever. Florida pastor Rodney Howard Brown's assertion that gathering limits of any sort are inherent, quote, discrimination against religion, end quote, it would be more credible if gathering in a building was the only way that people could possibly worship. As has been discussed during this conference, religious worship can take many forms. Worship as a category is not limited to gathering in a building. This reality undercuts somewhat any appeal to the second quality of fostering religion. As such, I do not think it can be effectively argued that the overwhelming majority of local and state mandates and policies can be considered unjust laws that citizens cannot be bound to follow. 
and even if these laws were unjust, it would still remain to delineate the conditions and limits of legitimate civil disobedience. Simply having a moral conviction that a law is unjust is not enough justification to willfully break that law. Otherwise, a citizen would only have to appeal to a deeply held moral conviction as license for anarchy. Linda Skitka dances around this critique in her scholarship on moral conviction as a social phenomenon. While she notes the possibility of moral convictions leading to pro-social behaviors, she leans much more heavily into the anti-social behaviors that can come from citizens acting on their moral convictions, such as a disregard for authority and social structures, willingness to break the law or commit violence in the name of a higher cause, and intolerance of others who do not share their views. While these are valid concerns, serious and reasoned defenses of moral conviction and civil disobedience do not give such license for breaking the law for one's own private good. Such defenses articulate specific bounds and conditions for civil disobedience. In her book, Conscience and Conviction, Kimberly Brownlee outlines four conditions for valid civil disobedience. They frame a boundary that neatly responds to concerns such as Skitka's and does so within a humanist framework. The first is the consistency condition. There must be consistency between our judgments and our behavior and between the expectations of ourselves and others. Our convictions must meet certain standards of intelligibility, internal coherence, and have some degree of evidential basis. The second is the universality condition. This requires us to make universal judgments that the injustice we deem wrong is wrong beyond a single instance or circumstance. This precludes holding ourselves to a different standard to others. Our moral convictions lack standing if they are so obviously self-serving rather than making objective judgments. The third condition is concerned with the non-evasiveness of the civil disobedient. This for Brownlee is a practical test for conscientiousness. It requires that we be willing to bear the risks of setting aside the law to face the consequences of honoring our convictions. This represents a categorical rejection of lawlessness or breaking the law with impunity. A willingness to bear the costs of one's actions lends greater credence and standing to their moral convictions. The fourth and last condition Brownlee outlines is the dialogic condition. This requires that we be willing to communicate our convictions to others in an attempt to engage in a reasoned dialogue and deliberation. For Brownlee, this shows that we believe our convictions are credible and, be, and can be given a reasoned defense. I take a greater, more fundamental point from it. It envisions civil disobedience as a public, dialogic act, signifying genuine effort to effect change. The act is a declaration that something is wrong a situation is unjust or a structure is oppressive. It argues that the state of affairs cannot continue and must change. Civil disobedience is an element of the discursive democratic tradition when the normal channels for legislation are unable or unwilling to address the problem at hand. So how does this all map onto the assertions of anti-maskers and rebelling pastors? Claims of COVID-19 being a hoax or a means for the government to exert greater control over our lives, or that masks are ineffective, are not logically consistent or at all evidence-based. Making an exception to gathering limits just for religious services does not fulfill the universality clause either. I suppose many masker, anti-maskers and violating pastors do not violently resist arrest, and thus would fulfill the non-evasive condition, but the willingness to bear the costs of their moral convictions has no bearing in of itself on the justness of their cause. And lastly, the general refusal of anti-maskers and pastors to accept facts, along with the vitriolic behavior we see from them in viral videos, does not speak to a willingness to engage in a rational dialogue. But perhaps many anti-maskers are not interested in a public act that's pushing for change, but rather a private act that best attends to their needs in ways that a general law does not. Such motivation would speak to the virtue of epikaia or equity, which seeks a higher rule of justice by setting aside the letter of the law. I turn to epikaia for two purposes. First, 
It considers the position of those violating COVID-19 mandates from another perspective. And second, I believe that the theological resources that inform the sort of prudential discernment that Epikaia requires would be useful to strengthen Brownlee's framework on legitimate civil disobedience. Epikaia is a commitment to fairness and equity. In its historical, technical, and legal sense, it involved the capacity for a judge to craft a special remedy to correct the deficiency of an ordinarily just law in special cases. However, Aristotle and Aquinas went deeper in their articulation of epikaia. It is not just an action, but a virtue. It involves cultivating the sort of character and disposition that can set aside the letter of the law in order to promote a higher rule of justice and advance the common good. For example, consider traffic laws. Stoplights serve the common good by imposing order and fairness for drivers at intersections. However, if an intersection is completely empty in the middle of the night and a parent is rushing their injured child to the hospital, then the common good is not being served in this specific instance by the ordinarily just law of stopping for red lights. The parent in question would need a sufficiently habituated character that is engaged with the virtues of justice and prudence to make the decision of running the red light for the sake of their child. There are two elements of prudence that come to play. Synesis, which is judgment according to common law or knowing that running light, red lights is formally prohibited and also known, a virtue of higher judgment. Nome enables the moral agent to judge according to higher principles rather than obedience to formal law and to discern when epikaia is at stake. Nome might lead the parent to recognize that the laws of traffic lights are normally just, but they are not serving the common good in delaying medical attention for their child, especially when driving through the red light presents no danger for anyone else as no other drivers are present. Thus, possessing the virtue of epikaia not only requires making the correct judgment concerning the situation and discerning the right action, but also possessing the right desire for undertaking it. The discernment required for equitable action is informed by the virtues of charity and solidarity. I hold that submitting to all law without any thought to higher moral principles would make obedience the greatest human virtue. However, the Christian life is fully animated by love of God and love of neighbor not in blind obedience. Charity and solidarity in pursuit of justice and the common good are the virtues that equip the moral agent to discern if civil disobedience or equitable action is required in a given situation. Just as was concluded when considering the conditions of valid civil disobedience, anti-maskers and pastors violating gathering limits cannot justly appeal to epikaia. Subjecting others to a deadly virus does not contribute to the common good. Even with a valid reason for a person to forego masks, charity and solidarity would still not lead that person to act in a way that puts others at risk. In the same way, the dissident pastor who believes that the local mandates are pursuing a good that does not include the good of the church has a wide array of technology and alternatives available to them so that the worship of God could be facilitated. The common good precludes prioritizing one's preferences above the needs and safety of one's neighbors. The common good is best ascertained through the virtues of charity and solidarity, which informs the discernment that civil disobedience and equitable action require. The actions of anti-maskers and pastors violating COVID-19 restrictions do not meet the criteria for legitimate civil disobedience as outlined by Brownlee, do not pursue the sort of higher rule of justice that Epikaia is concerned with, and the laws they are violating are not unjust in the first place. Citizens do have a moral right to act on their moral convictions and to even set aside the letter of the law in doing so. But that moral right comes with conditions and qualifiers that these dissident actors have not met. Thank you all. Thank you, Anthony. Our next presentation comes from Leonardo de Mendoza. Leonardo is a graduate student at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California, where he is pursuing a Master of Arts in Theology. Mr. Mendoza assists the graduate program in theological studies with the planning and coordination of the annual Hispanic Ministry and Theology Lecture, was the co-convener of the Women in Theology Conference, and is an advocate for graduate students at LMU. 
His research interests include the intersection between theology and ethics and the role of religion in public discourse. Leonardo will be presenting his paper entitled Religious Liberty and the COVID-19 Pandemic, Ignoring Social Responsibility in the Name of Freedom During a Public Health Crisis. Leonardo. Thank you. Well, it's been nearly a year since COVID-19 changed the way in which the global community has functioned. Uh, we now know that the coronavirus is highly contagious and deadly. According to the John Hopkins University of Medicine, there are over uh, 105 million cases worldwide and over 2 million people have lost their lives as a result of COVID-19. In the domestic front, over 500,000 people have passed away as a result of COVID-19. The easy transmissibility of the virus, along with its high death tolls, led state, county, and city governments to enact public emergency public health orders, which led to businesses and other venues deemed non-essentials to close. Some of these emergency health orders deemed churches as non-essential businesses. As a result, uh, in some instances, it limited the attendance of in-person uh, services. It required the use of face masks. It mandated social distancing between family units. However, these orders have received objections from Catholic clergymen who believe that these orders are unconstitutional because they allege their right to religious freedom is being infringed. Some of the Catholic clergymen that have raised their objections include the Archbishop of San Francisco, Salvatore Cordiglione, who has been an outspoken critic of government responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the case of San Francisco, the Attorney General of the city issued a health order, which the Archbishop says treats religious worship as non-essential activity while allowing nail salons, massage, and tattoo parlors to remain open. Cordelione claims that this order is the kind of blatant discrimination to which the Supreme Court gave injunctive relief in New York. Uh, the case he cites is that of Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn versus, of New York versus Andrew Cuomo. In this case, the conservative justice having a majority on the court ruled against health and safety protocols enacted by the state of New York. However, Justice Sonia Sotomayor uh, dissented in that opinion, saying that she saw no need to grant an exemption from these health and safety orders. She based her dissent on the grounds that at the time, this pandemic had taken a quarter million lives. She argues that her colleagues failed to consider the real risks that come from indoor gatherings as it relates to the spread of the virus she echoes the concerns of medical experts who contend that these large groups of gatherings where people are speaking and singing in close proximity indoors for an extended period of time can become super spreader events. Sotomayor believes that this uh, exemption would exacerbate the spread of the virus and result in more deaths, which would amount to a blatant disregard of human life. In her article, The Right to Religious Freedom, a Theological Comment, the ethicist Tilly Hawker makes the case against the politicization of religious liberty. She argues that in the present day, there are a growing number of populist figures and movements who are bent on misusing religious liberty to create Christian national politics. This movement seeks to enshrine beliefs, moralities, and values of one specific group over all other groups resulting in the trampling of rights of others, including the right to freedom of religion of other groups. She also identifies the dangerous convergence between the misuse and abuse of religious freedom on the part of political and religious groups. Hacker contends that both groups will use the concept of God to justify their agenda and enshrine it in law or policy. <clears throat> 
some of these uh, policies or agenda of the uh, religious and political groups misusing the right to religious freedom has resulted in exemptions that threaten to, well, that violate rights of other groups. These exemptions also circumvent the rule of law and the role of the courts in American society. This holds true for the following reasons. Religious exemptions do not consider the rights of other religious groups or individuals. It creates an inequality which violates the rights of others. The United States must apply all uh, its citizens equally. It must apply their rights equally and must protect the rights of all people equally. In the case of religious freedom, this means that it is not an absolute right that tramples other rights. This means that emergency public health mandates during the time of a pandemic is not an infringement. This is true even if the mandates require the use of face masks, require social distancing, or place limits on the in-person capacity, even if it suspends the indoor religious services temporarily because these emergency public health orders stem from a moral and ethical imperative to protect people from harm. Therefore, to claim that these orders are arbitrary or discriminatory infringements on the, the right to freedom of religion is not only a dishonest representation, it's a cynical one. These actions by our state and local governments came from a lack of national leadership. There was no national strategy. And it has resulted in states taking varying approaches depending on their uh, caseload of uh, hospitalizations and cases. For example, in Oregon, uh, their bishop, along with their diocesan task force on COVID-19, released a statement prohibiting priests from wearing face masks at liturgical celebrations. Uh, they call the potential risk of contracting COVID-19 at a religious service a momentary interaction that presents an acceptable risk. They also say that if a parishioner chooses not to wear a face mask, they should be reminded of the mandate. But ultimately, the bishop along with his task force says, who can tell why a face is uncovered? Woe to us if we reach the point of demanding an answer as the price of admission to the house of prayer. The required use of masks is not the only point of contention. In an article published on a National Catholic Register entitled, Canceling Public Masses in Rome is Not the Answer to the Coronavirus, Charles Pope argues that canceling public celebrations of the Eucharist and other liturgical services was the cowardly thing to do. He claims to be more concerned about the loss of courage and the loss of faith. He cites the actions of Charles Borromeo during the plague of 1576 as a reason to continue public liturgical celebrations. He addresses criticism that he might get on the grounds that people are dying. He responds in his article saying he can only respond by saying that souls are dying due to fear and worldly obsession with death. Death will come to all of us, not likely by coronavirus. He goes on to ask, are you ready to, to die and face judgment? He closes his article by invoking the God to which Hacker uh, says these figures invoke in their Christian national identity politic to free us from foolish and unfaithful concerns and to help us be most concerned with what matters to God. Our bodies will die, but our souls will endure. This is also the blatant disregard to which Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote about in her dissent. Uh, 
it disregards human life for the sake of a right that some might deem as absolute. The Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church teaches that the right that rights come with duties and responsibilities. The Compendium teaches that those who claim to have rights but forget to carry out their respective duties are people who build with one hand and destroy with the other. This holds true even in the pandemic. The right to religious freedom does not give pastors or parishioners the freedom to put others in harm's way. There is an ethical and moral imperative to keep parishioners safe from harm. The wearing of face masks, practicing social distancing, limiting capacity, holding services outdoors or even virtually are all alternatives that can fulfill these ethical and moral imperatives. Another responsibility with this right is to be faithful to the calling that these clergymen claim to have received from God in the church. An example of this fidelity would be to care for and love their parishioners enough to at least as a minimum wear face masks during public liturgical celebrations. Follow the social distancing guidelines. Again, this is the bare minimum. If they are truly shepherds and care for their flock, this is something that they can do. Uh, furthermore, in October of last year, Pope Francis held an audience with doctors and nurses of Italy, where, among other things, he lauded their heroic efforts for caring for COVID-19 patients. And that same audience, the Pope criticized priests who violate the health orders, calling them as calling them adolescents. He also encouraged priests and hopes that they would find creative ways to minister to the faithful while keeping them free from harm. In Fratelli Tutti, the Pope teaches that false securities have been shaken by this pandemic. The veil in which we hid our day-to-day -day activities and the way in which governments responded to the needs of their people has been ripped away. In the case of parishes, faith communities led by clergy, the global pandemic erupted in a rapid and unprecedented manner. It caught the world and the church by surprise, and it caught the world and the church unprepared. But it's been almost a year. The normal that was torn down by the pandemic, the false securities that have been torn down are visible to all. 500,000, 500, 500 uh, half a million people are dead as a result of the virus. We have the knowledge and information needed to act in a mature and responsible way. There is no longer an excuse for willfully ignoring the reality of our present and the real danger that COVID-19 presents for our communities. Fratelli Tutti teaches and offers a framework to build a responsible response to the pandemic. Pope writes that no one is saved alone. We can only be saved together. Therefore, we have a responsibility to care for one another, to care for our neighbor, to be our siblings keeper, to act like adults rather than adolescents. This means that we follow the emergency health orders. Our religious commitment and our right to religious liberty does not depend on where or how one worships, but on how one practices their faith measured by their love for their neighbor. This is best demonstrating and respecting the equally sacred rights of our sisters and brothers, respecting their right to be healthy. The right to religious freedom does not give us the right 
caused one of our sisters or brothers to contract COVID-19, suffer from it, and potentially die from it. The right to religious freedom does not give anyone the right to neglect social responsibility in the name of freedom during a public health crisis. Clerics, lay ministers, and other people of good faith must be responsible in exercising their First Amendment right. While they are free to practice their faith, they cannot do it in a way that it infringes on the rights of others. There is no ethical, moral, or religious justification that would condone the risking of lives of others in the name of God or in the name of freedom. This virus has taken over half a million lives in the United States and over 2 million lives worldwide. We must also acknowledge that we live in a pluralistic society. The right to religious freedom applies to all groups, not just one group. Thank you. Thank you, Leonardo. And our final presentation today comes from Christoph Ries Grossfeld. Christoph is a THM student in systematic theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. Aside from Karl Barth studies, one of his main interests is political theology, specifically the relationship between church and state in American life in theology. Christoph will present his paper entitled, Reading Karl Barth in the COVID-19 Era, What Even is Freedom? Christoph. Thank you, Zach. Um, thanks to everyone who's here. I'm glad to share this paper with you all and um, hear some, some conversations. So here, here it goes. The COVID-19 pandemic has undoubtedly accentuated the issue of freedom in American life. In the early days of COVID-19 here in the States, lockdowns of unessential businesses dominated the news headlines. And many at first seemed to be more or less amenable to such measures from their local governments. However, as the months progress, many started to vocally resent such countermeasures, including religious leaders. A perfect example of this is seen in the evangelical world with the worship leader, Sean Foyt and his campaign and I would argue promotional tour, Let Us Worship. In response to California Governor Gavin Newsom's restrictions on singing in religious gatherings due to the high possibility of spreading COVID-19, Foyt claims, our freedom to worship God and obey his word has come under unprecedented attack. Powerful politicians have engaged in uncharted abuses of religious liberty. Silencing the faithful, banning our voices, and outright attacking our God-given right to declare his goodness. Notice Foyt's word choice here. He uses the words freedom and unprecedented attack to imply that Americans would normally be privileged enough to not experience limitations to their ability to worship. It is a God-given right to freely worship out loud, even during a pandemic, especially in the US. No politician, according to Foyt, can limit the American Christian's right to worship. For this reason, Foyt appeals to the American mythos of the, fr the frontier and the liberty associated with it. He states, the, fer the fervor to worship God free from government edict and societal persecution drove America's earliest settlers across oceans and wild frontiers to this beautiful land to create a new nation of inalienable rights like that of life and liberty. Freud is not alone with his concerns for religious liberty, as we saw with other presenters uh, talked about. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito shares a similar sentiment with Freud by recently lamenting on a Zoom call with young conservative lawyers, it pains me to say this, but in certain quarters, religious liberty is fast becoming a disfavored right. Alito further comments, we have never before seen restrictions as severe, extensive, and prolonged on individual religious liberty. Now, let us be clear here, what Freud and Alito have explained are not isolated beliefs. From pastors like Rodney Howard Brown being arrested in Florida for defying COVID-19 restrictions, to the scores of people at Prayer March 2020, led by infamous evangelist Franklin Graham back in the fall, it is clear that the concept of religious liberty is a sacrosanct idea in American culture. This essay though will ultimately problematize this fixed understanding of freedom in religious life through Karl Barth's own concept of freedom as presented not only in his church dogmatics, 
but also in a small lecture entitled The Gift of Freedom. As we shall see, through this lens, we will be proposing that freedom does not preclude communion or social responsibility. Before exegeting Bart, however, we'll be first briefly laying out the inherent problems of freedom in American life in order to ground our discussion concerning the Swiss theologian. The problem of freedom in American life. Freedom is the most potent concept in American parlance, for it helps Americans understand themselves as a nation of self-governing individuals. Not only though does this word have a powerful identity claim, it also serves as a powerful political tool. Freedom has been etched into the American political psyche. To illustrate, American political leaders have often used the term freedom to garner support for war. World War II, for instance, was considered by President Franklin D. Roosevelt as the war for the four freedoms. It is clear then that we in America often talk of freedom as if it were a fixed concept that everyone should know and understand, for after all, we are the land of the free and the cradle of liberty. As historian Eric Foner points out, however, freedom in American history has often been a different, has often had a different definition for different people. Foner rightfully notes then that freedom has been the subject of persistent conflict in American history. An elucidating example of the contentious history of this concept of freedom is the role of slave masters. The supposed freedom of the slave master rested on the evil reality of slavery in America. It's quite ironic then that our freedom in our history has often been defined by its limits. Freedom has a history of being parochially defined. When Abraham Lincoln famously said that American government is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, you have to ask who the people are. Um, is an individual's freedom more important than the people of the individual's community. Thus the problem of freedom in American history is the individualistic emphasis it tends to have. We often hear of this individualistic emphasis through the American idiom, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. As a result of this individualism, communal responsibility has often diminished. W.E.B. Du Bois recognized the result of individualism in his book, Black Reconstruction in America, by saying that individualist ideology obstructed America's social and economic democratization. Individualism has diluted freedom by making some Americans shirk their social responsibility for others. This is what we will take up in our discussion, um, Barton Freedom. Carl Barton, Human Freedom. Carl Barton's definition of freedom is counterintuitive to our American democratic sensibilities. Bart theologically understands the word freedom as one that humanity possesses because of God's own freedom. In other words, humanity's freedom comes from the free God as a gift. While many Americans of faith would agree with this theological proposal, I presume, Bart goes beyond this mere understanding by exclaiming further that God is the object of human freedom. In his lecture, Bart Abers, the gift of freedom involves more than being offered one option among several. Humanity becomes free by choosing in accordance with the freedom of God. Trying to escape from God's own freedom is not human freedom. Bart hence views freedom as one that reorients humanity to a specific task. But what exactly is this task? For the Swiss theologian, freedom is one that entails Gemeinschaft or communal relations or just simply community. He illustrates this by appealing to God's freedom because as mentioned above, humanity's freedom depends on and stems from God's own freedom. Bart explains, God is ase for God's self, but God is pronobis for us. This is to say that God's freedom also entails God's communion with humanity. And since humanity's freedom comes from God's freedom, it too is one of communal relations. Freedom, theologically defined, is one that opens up the individual to a larger community and hence a greater communal responsibility. Just like God's freedom does not only entail God's aseity, but also God's covenantal relationship with humanity, human freedom similarly awakens the individual to a larger task of service. It is appropriate here to make a distinction, a quick distinction between two types of freedoms. On the one hand, there's freedom from, negative freedom. And on the other hand, there is freedom to and freedom for, positive freedom. <clears throat> 
Now, of course, political philosophers over the years have discussed in length the distinction between positive and negative freedom. See, for example, uh, Charles Taylor, Philosophy and the Human Sciences. Although we will not be delving deep into this distinction, it should suffice to say, considering the theological scope of this essay, that some of these political philosophers have noted that positive freedom, as opposed to negative freedom, entails a sense of duty for others. Hegel, for example, says, duty is not a restriction on positive freedom. Therefore, for Barth, the free person is one who, rather than remaining passive, acts with a sense of communal duty. For this reason, he remarks, private Christianity is not Christianity at all. Private theology is not free theology. It is not theology at all. Some might be wondering, however, what exactly does this action entail for Barth? Is it just focusing on the betterment of the church community? That is, is this freedom that Barth proposes one that remains within the confines of the church, where this action is solely for the church? If yes, then how does this version of freedom differ from the understanding of freedom that people like Sean Foyt treasure? Here, we must now proceed to, par uh, to Barth's um, church dogmatics to sketch the theological practicality of freedom. Karl Barth's concept of the community for the world. In section 72 of Church Dogmatics, Barth reflects on the church's mission in the world. Here, he argues that the freedom of the Christian community is not solely meant for the church. He explains, the community of Jesus Christ is for the world. In other words, for each and every person, for the person of every age and place, who finds the totality of earthly creation, the setting, object, and instrument, and yet also the frontier of one's life and work. Part of why the community of Jesus Christ, in other words, the church, ought to be for the world is because the church is itself part of the worldly community. He says the community of Jesus Christ is itself creature and therefore world. As a consequence, the church's mission is to live out its reality as a free creature for its fellow creatures. The church then does not solely exist for itself, or to put it differently, Christians cannot solely think about church matters by hermetically sealing themselves off from the outside world. Rather, the church maintains its own life as it interposes and gives itself for all other human creatures. The church partly lives out its purpose as one of service for others in the worldly community. Bart's understanding of the church's mission stems from his reflections of the nature of the church as one that exists at its most fundamental level for God in order to enact God's purposes for the world. He says, first and foremost, it is God who exists for the world. And since the community of Jesus Christ exists, for the, exists first and supremely for God, it has no option but its own manner and place to exist for the world. Therefore, the basis of the church's mission for the world derives from God, from God being for the world. The community of Jesus Christ has the basis of its being in nature in God. Because of the church's mission as the community of Jesus Christ for the world, Bart additionally maintains that an ecclesiology must add this mark of the church in its practical outworking. The problem, as Bart sees it, is the history of the doctrine of church is that it has often produced a holy egoism, where it seems to imply that the church ought to fight not only against the flesh and the devil, but also against the world. That's his quote. Bart goes even as far as to speculate that some 16th and 17th century Protestants lack the joy in mission. And what is this joy in particular for Bart is the joy knowing that the free God is the God of all these people, that God's omnipotent mercy rules over all without exception. Therefore, the freedom of the community of Jesus Christ involves serving all without exception in the same way that God is the Lord of every person. Conclusion, responsible freedom in COVID-19. In Barth's analysis of human freedom, we have seen that freedom is not simply defined as an absence of limits, as some religious leaders like Sean Foyt would have us think. There is a weighty responsibility for the church and its freedom to awaken to its larger duty for the world. With the year we had in 2020, especially when COVID-19 first hit here in the US, a myriad of religious leaders have adapted admirably during these times. From using Zoom to utilizing YouTube Live for religious services, many have come under the conviction that loving one's neighbor simply means not giving them COVID-19. However, with someone like Foyt, we see that one's desire to worship out loud is more important than not giving someone this voracious virus. Part of the problem here is how the concept of freedom is understood. 
specifically is understood as a fixed category without the need for further revisions. Yet, when we consider Barth and the tradition from which he stems from, the reform tradition, we see a paradoxical recapturing of the communal elements of freedom. This furthermore highlights the issue of pastoral care inherent in Barth's theology. By pastoral care, we are not talking about a duty just for clergy. Instead, we are talking about the responsibility of the whole community to serve the world. Hence, as Barth says, no one can escape the responsibility for pastoral care. It is appropriate, therefore, to conclude with these words from the French reformer John Calvin in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Quote, we must at all times seek after love and the edification of our neighbor. We should use our freedom if it results in the edification of our neighbor, but if it does not help our neighbor, then we should forego it. End quote. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. And thanks again to Danny and to Anthony and to Leonardo for great presentations. I'll now turn the floor over to Dr. Caveney for her response. Dr. Caveney. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this conference and giving me the opportunity to, um, to uh, read your papers and to ponder their uh, very important thoughts. Um, I, 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 it struck me listening to them that we really have kind of a nice parallel in the papers. Uh, Danny's and Leonardo's papers really look at what the obligation of the state is toward religious believers. And in a sense, uh, Christoph's and Anthony's papers really look at what the responsibilities of religious believers are um, in the face of regulations designed um, to, uh, you know, to preserve the public health of the community. Uh, so I think there's a really good balance because they are both uh, important uh, questions that have to be answered. Um, so what I'd like to do in my response uh, is, is first off uh, to just encourage you all to continue along the lines that you're working on. Um, it's very important, I think, not to cede the law of religion to lawyers, um, particularly to uh, the activist lawyers that are on and are litigating before the Supreme Court. Uh, they see themselves as defending religion in many cases, but they tend to have a less uh, nuanced view of what religion is, how it's developed, how it obligates in, in contrast with other, uh, with other responsibilities than uh, say religious studies uh, professors and theology professors have. So uh, I'd like to commend you for your interdisciplinarity and encourage you to keep going uh, in this direction. Here, uh, I'd like to do a couple of things, uh, just small things. One, to provide a little bit more legal context to sharpen some of the questions that arose um, in the first two legal papers in my grouping, not actually as we heard them. And then second, uh, because it's a cold, rainy day uh, and Sometimes as a lawyer, I get oppositional to provide a little bit more religious context of, uh, you know, of what might be going on with those who oppose some of the, the regulations that we've uh, seen uh, to restrict uh, worship services and other things uh, to prevent the spread of COVID, excuse me. And then third, to ask just a question of each paper just to get the discussion rolling. So uh, let's start with a little bit of the legal context. Uh, two papers, uh, as, I say, as I stated, grappled with the changing protection of religion under the constitution. I think this is an enormously important uh, set of questions to look at. And I just wanna highlight some of the changes and give a little bit more background to those people who don't uh, you know, keep up to date with uh, First Amendment, just to emphasize this as a, as a little bit more sturdy foundation for our discussion. So as, as, as was pointed out, the First Amendment to the Constitution reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof 
or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of people to peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Notice when I read that, that's kind of a, a, a big collection of things that Congress can't do. All of that is part of the First Amendment. And there are some people that think it needs to be read more together, but we do break it apart into the religion clauses, uh, the free exercise clause and the establishment clause. And then we tend to analyze the free exercise clause and the establishment clause somewhat separately. Um, that can be challenged. I think it's a problem, but that's a bit what's going on. And that's certainly what's going on here. We're focusing on the free exercise clause of religion, which says that Congress shall, shall make no law respecting dot, 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 prohibiting the free exercise thereof of religion. So what, what's the basic groundwork that we're dealing with here? Well, kind of, it's not the beginning, it's not the end, but I think the fulcrum of our discussion is a case called Employment Division versus Smith, which was handed down by the Supreme Court in 1990. And in that case, the court, Scalia writing the majority opinion said, religious belief is absolute. You can believe whatever you want, good for you. But actions are something else. Neutral laws of general applicability, regulating acts do not violate the free exercise clause, even if they impinge on religious activity in some way. It's sort of like too bad, no harm, no foul. Now Scalia also said it's different if the law targets religion specifically, so if you, you can make a law saying no gold statues, but you can't say, well, you can make gold statues, but not golden calves. That targets religion. That's bad. But any sort of law, say the general narcotics laws, are not raising a free exercise claim as long as they're rationally related to a reasonable government interest. So... Scalia was mainly concerned to justify the right of the majority to regulate social order without being bothered by people with religious beliefs. And it's pretty clear from the way he writes the opinion, this is my view at least, that he is worried about the moral majority, the largely Christian majority, um, being bothered by people of minority religions. And so one of the results is the case is that the court held that religious beliefs did not excuse people from complying with laws forbidding polygamy, child labor laws, Sunday closing laws, laws requiring registration for secret service, and laws requiring the payment of social security taxes. We don't even need to get to the First Amendment. We're not targeting you. At the same time, Scalia is comfortable that people who are in the majority, religions who are in the majority, will be able to work out protections for themselves. Now, this case generated a great deal of um, opposition in, uh, you know, in Supreme Court circles and in the public, and, and it resulted in the passage of a law called RIFRA, the Res uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which said, no, that law that you've articulated in Smith, that rule, it's too, it's too uh, unprotective of religion. We're going to go back to the older test, which came in a case called Sherbert versus Werner, Ver Werner that said that laws burdening, burdening the free exercise of religion are subject to strict scrutiny if their effect burdens, not only if their intent is to burden. So if there's a substantial burden on someone's free exercise, the state has to show there's a compelling state interest that's being achieved and that the state's gone about achieving that interest using the least restrictive means. So RIFRA is a statute. It looks like a constitutional law. It's just a statute. So it applies to federal regulations, basically, arguably to federal laws passed after, after RIFRA, but 
That's a bit iffy. It mainly applies to regulations, which is why it applied in the case of the Hobby Lobby uh, controversy, because what was at stake was the code of regulations implementing the Affordable Care Act. Um, RIFRA, it's interesting, used to be used to protect religious minorities. It was thought, well, we need to have RIFRA to protect the rights of Native Americans to uh, you know, to smoke peyote, but increasingly, as the culture wars have worn on, uh, we've seen that it has been used to protect conservative, uh, conservative Christians and Jews and maybe Muslims, but who are member of the kind of conservative moral majority. Um, but it is true that RIFRA really only applies to regulation, and um, and the Smith decision applies to uh, federal law and to state laws because the federal government's First Amendment, you know, doesn't in, in, um, applies to the uh, the federal, uh, excuse me, the constant, the Supreme Court's interpretation of the First Amendment applies to states, not Congress's law on this matter. But what I think was pointed out in some of, uh, of, of, these, uh, of the papers today is that it may look as if there is a return to the more restrictive Sherbert standard in looking at what the First Amendment itself requires. Um, that, that we may be sort of subtly on the way toward overruling Smith and going back to a more religion protective view, not only of RIFRA, but of the First Amendment itself. And I see that in Gorsuch's uh, opinion in the Diocese of Brooklyn versus Cuomo case, where he says, government is not free to disregard the First Amendment in times of crisis. At a minimum, that amendment protects government officials from treating religious exercises worse than comparative secular activities unless they are pursuing a compelling state interest in using the least restrictive means available. That's an iffy statement in a way because it looks like you're bringing up, um, you know, kind of the the uh, the older Sherbert standard in the context of the First Amendment. Kavanaugh's descent um, in Cavalry, tra uh, Cavalry Chapel is really pushing well beyond um, Smith and back towards Sherbert. The co converse free exercise or equal treatment question, he says, is whether the legislature is required to place religion on a most favored uh, 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 category rather than a disfavored or non-exempt category. I think if you go back and look at this interpretation in light of Smith, it's clear that religion in the Kavanaugh world, in the Gorsuch world, is getting, uh, you know, um, much more delicate and deferential treatment. So I think we may be looking at the death knell of Smith. Um, I think we are entering in some ways a, a different world in conjunction with the originalism that's now taking over the Supreme Court uh, in terms of a method of interpretation. I think you're seeing a view that privileges uh, established old line uh, mainstream religions uh, and sees them as something that, you know, that needs protection against an increasingly secular world. Um, and that brings me to my second point. Uh, when I read these Supreme Court opinions uh, protecting uh, the religious groups, uh, and when I read some of the, uh, you know, some of the, the blogs and the, the tweets of conservative uh, religious figures, and, you know, particularly Christian, but also Jewish, the undertone I feel, the undertone I experience is fear. I, why fear? I think if you read the opinions under letting, uh, undercutting the laws, uh, you know, of, of, of mask wearing and that carefully, you see signs of a different way of viewing the virus that's dominant in conservative religious circles. The fear is not of the virus per se. And I think there's a difference we need to acknowledge. 
The fear is of the social consequences of the virus. Some people talk about it as the great reset if they're thinking of themselves in terms of a conspiracy theory. But even those who don't see a, 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 a conspiracy of a great reset see further evidence and entrenchment of the priority of the secular, failure to see religious belief and practice as a compelling aspect of life, and more broadly, the dominance of a horizon of imminence the sense that the only thing that matters is human life here and now, not a connection to an internal uh, or to, to an eternal perspective. So within the positive religious framework that resists that, there is a coherent view. Uh, they see intentional killing is always wrong of the innocent, so no euthanasia, no abortion. But dying itself is a fact of life no particular need to save any particular lives. Uh, they, they see themselves as asserting death, not as the end, but as the gateway to eternal life. What matters is not that you die, but how you die. Uh, there's more emphasis on the Ars Moriendi, the art of dying well, and they see the COVID crisis as interfering with that the nursing home crisis where you can't go visit old people and loved ones in their nursing homes, you can't bring them the sacraments. And they are upset at the failure of, uh, of Catholic churches in particular to fight for the importance of the sacraments. They see the focus on fighting COVID as a distortion of what they need to carry out, uh, I think, a you know, a, a natural religious life. It's almost more of a natural religious life, um, even than a specifically Catholic religious life. Some of them have talked about, well, COVID mainly targets older people. It's dangerous for older people, but they've lived a full life and we believe in eternal life. Anti-COVID measures undercut the needs of the young to work and to form families and to bring up children themselves to worship God. Anti-COVID measures confirm isolation and enforce isolation, which they believe leads to an inability of religious believers to band together in the face of hostile measures to fight the ongoing culture war against secularism. I think of all the opinions I read, I've read in this, uh, kind of Supreme Court treatment of COVID regulations, Gorsuch uh, gets, uh, gets this uh, view across uh, most bitterly. Um, he writes in the Roman Catholic Archdiocese case, the only explanation for treating religious places differently seems to be a judgment that what happens there just isn't as essential as what happens in secular spaces. Indeed, the governor is remarkably frank about this. In his judgments, laundry and liquor, travel and tools are all essential, while traditional religious exercises are not. So Gorsuch and Alito to some degree, Les Roberts, uh, I think Amy Barrett will fall into this category, are worried about a world in which secularism will be even more dominant because religious believers won't be able to exercise their specific calling, you know, of tending to the dying, uh, affirming the importance of life after death, and, and creating community for a long period of time. Now, why did I go through all of that? Well, I think we, those of us who are religious, and at the same time support the regulations, really need to do more to grapple with some of the fears of those people um, who are our co-religionists who don't see things in the same way. And so what I'd like to ask each of the papers writers to do is maybe answer one of the questions that for me is raised by my reading of conservatives who are opposed to these regulations. Uh, and maybe we can use that to start the discussion. So my first question is for Danny, who wrote the paper, Religion as the Most Favored Nation, COVID-19 and the First Amendment at the S Supreme Court. 
Um, it's really, I guess, a two-part question. You saw with Gorsuch that a key frame problem with him is that is that the states are not seeing religious services as essential services. It really offends him, and I think it offends a lot of religious believers. So how should the court, in your view, view the importance of religious services? In the terms that believers view them would be one option. And if so, which believers? The most fervent believers, the, the B plus Catholics, you know, the people who are sort of there because, you know, well, what else are you gonna do? And I might as well have a Pascalian insurance policy. So that would be one way, look at believers, but then you have to ask which believers. Should it put it in the category of entertainment? Well, here's what people do on a Saturday, uh, you know, some of them or Sunday, some of them watch football, some of them go to church from the perspective of the state, which needs to remain neutral. It's closest to an act of entertainment. Or should it be viewed more like medicine itself? you know, this is for your spiritual health. So at the very least, it should be put in the category of psychiatric treatment or psychologists. And we allow people to go to those um, and get together with those people. So how do you think the court should view religious services? And then the second and related question is whose perspective should the court adopt in assessing the weight of the law. That's another thing that I think that we see um, that the court is kind of uh, surreptitiously playing around with. In some cases, it adopts the perspective of religious believers in looking at you know, how important the law is you know, that, that's burdening them. And I think you could see that in the Hobby Lobby case where uh, Justice Alito really minimized the importance of contraception. In other cases, and I think Sotomayor pointed that out in one of her opinions in the COVID cases, the court seems to be adopting the government's perspective. So when it upheld the so-called Muslim ban, it adopted not the perspective of Muslims who are affected by the ban, but the perspective of the lawmakers, Donald Trump, um, in, uh, in passing the ban. So how do we think, where do you put the court in evaluating essentiality and the weight of the law overall? That's my first question for Danny. My second question for Leonardo, who wrote the paper, Religious Liberty and the COVID-19 Pandemic, Ignoring Social Responsibilities in the Name of Freedom During a Public Health Crisis, is in a way a little bit more fundamental. You quote Pope Francis very beautifully in his Fratelli Tutti and you say that all persons have a responsibility to care for their neighbor, to be their siblings keeper, the pathway, therefore the pathway for a responsible ministerial approach during a time of pandemic would be to renew our commitment to caring for one's neighbor. That's beautiful, but I think some of the people who resist the imposition of COVID regulations would say it doesn't fully answer the question because we've got to care for our neighbor in two ways. One is temporally, but we also have to care for their spiritual well-being. So access to the sacraments, access to actual services, um, gathering together in small faith communities. That may not be as big a deal for younger people who are used to uh, gathering online and Zoom and tweeting, but for many of the older people who would like to be able to get together with their worshiping communities, Zoom and these technologies are existentially unavailable. In addition, if what you are trying to do is form a community that's oriented toward life with God um, and a, you know, that transcends this, um, we need to think about how we should relate the spiritual and the temporal. Should the court 
Should the government take into account spiritual goods or should they be entirely off the radar? Christoph's paper, my third question, uh, comes from thinking about what he sees in reading Karl Barr in the COVID-19 era America, what even is freedom? That is a terrific question. And, and I think you really explicated Barr incredibly well on this. And, and of course, in so doing, you brought in Augustine and the difference between uh, libertas or freedom for and freedom used rightly and free will, just freedom of choice. You connected that to the not identical but related concepts of negative freedom and positive freedom. Positive for libertas for Augustine, and I think for Bart, just isn't positive freedom, freedom for, but positive freedom used rightly. This is wonderful as a call to religious believers. But what should, and I guess I'm asking you, what should we do about this in a pluralistic society where we don't all agree on what positive freedom is and what positive freedom should look for? Look at the shipwreck that came from John Rawls's theory, right? He, in a sense, had a positive theory of a positive good. We should all contribute to, you know, uh, a welfare state to the extent that uh, we can so that the least well off are better off in some ways. Can you take any efforts to enforce a law or to call for a law about positive freedom? Or is this simply meant to be a call you give to religious believers not to behave badly and to show respect to the um, to the, to the rules that are in place. So is the theology speaking to religious believers saying obey the law for these reasons? Or is this a message that goes out more broadly to the political community? Uh, and finally, um, Anthony Harrison's paper, uh, which is related to his, um, his, his dissertation topic, and I was pleased to have been on his comps committee. And again, congratulations for having uh, passed this. Uh, you know, you're comprehensive and getting onto your dissertation that looks fascinating. And I think you've got a really interesting setup between civil disobedience on the one hand, where you make an, you know, you disobey a law for purposes really of bringing about a change in the law. And epikaya, on the other hand, where you say, well, look, nobody meant the law to apply in this particular case. I'll run the red light at midnight to get my kid to the doctor. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how you think about a middle category, or do you think of exemptions as a middle category? So what I think the bishops would say, what I think the religious leaders would say is, we're not talking about a one-off situation and we do want some kind of a coordination. We want to work with the government. So this is an epikaya, we're doing it ourselves. We don't want full-blown civil disobedience, but what we're calling for is you to work with us to come up with a law that's more tailored to our specific needs. You could argue it's a middle category between epikaya and civil disobedience. But then you get to Leonardo's point, which I think is that exemptions are unequal. Who gets exemptions and why? And why should religious believers, as opposed to other sorts of people, get exemptions? You also get to, I think, the point um, that uh, Danny raised, which is, you know, once the court gets into the category of scrutinizing exemptions um, with the lens of, of, of a, let's say, a hermeneutic of suspicion, any possible way in which religion is treated less favorably than everybody is a sign of discrimination then how will exemptions even be a politically workable uh, thing? And will we be forced back on 
you know, epikaya, people doing what they can when they're not seen, or civil disobedience to laws that have been forced to be so general in order to comply with, um, you know, with the letter of Smith. So those are my questions. Um, I don't know if um, if we have time to answer them. So I'm sorry if I took up too much time. Not at all. That's what they're here for. Uh, so so we have about 10 minutes left. Um, what I'll do is I'll just ask uh, Danny and Christoph and Anthony and Leonardo to unmute yourself and, and enter the conversation uh, when you feel comfortable doing so in response to, to Dr. Caveney's comments. And uh, we'll just go until time. Sure, I'll, uh, I can respond briefly. The first thing that came to my head was that um, I do think that there's, there's something there about uh, maybe not a need for a, a middle category in um, public discourse and our civil society, but at, at the very least, um, an acknowledgement that I think a lot of people are, even if they don't have the language of, um, you know, Brownlee's four conditions or the language of Epikaya, um, that they are, they're in that a similar headspace of, of thinking to themselves, well, this isn't just a private act that I think only I should be going without a mask or that only my church should be having, um, you know, services. So it's not, it's not that intensely private, but then, but then it's not, kind of rising to that level of a public, you know, this, this great public dialogic act that Brownlee's talking about. So I think, I think there's something there. Um, I take the concerns about um, exemptions quite seriously because my, my first thought was like, okay, well, you know, the, the language of accept, exemptions, that's, that could be worthwhile, you know, if, um, you know, narrowly tailoring law, let's get to, you know, let's get to the specifics, let's get to, um, you know, let's, let's arrive at something that does promote um, the common good, which includes the specific good of, you know, whether it's religious groups or, you know, people with respiratory issues who claim that masks, um, you know, irritate them. I respond that they, that's all the more reason they shouldn't be out in public without a mask, but that's either here or there. Um, my, yeah, so I, 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 agree with the with the concerns there my concerns i have further concerns with kind of this language of let's let's find and craft exemptions um for these re groups religious or otherwise um because power dynamics come into play my concerns are also well who what groups have the ability and resources to push for to litigate and push for these exemptions and and to lobby um for them, are our small are small religious minority groups going to continue to you know be neglected and ignored because they don't have maybe, say teams of teams of activist lawyers um, pushing for them? But that said, I do I'm I'm very interested in this middle ground, so to speak, because not all um, because when I, when I talk about charity and solidarity, and of course you can only do so much in 15 minutes. Um, I think that the the internal act of both civil disobedience and epikaya is similar. The the sort of discernment that an individual needs to to make that sort of decision when they're responding to injustice, they're responding to suffering, they're responding to their needs of their neighbor, and you know a, a law or a policy is standing in their way. Whether that's an individual immediate act out of urgency, or whether it's responding to a, a categorically unjust law. I think the internal act is the same, that sort of prudential discernment informed by charity and solidarity. Um, but I don't think those two polar opposite categories cover the whole group. Um, so I imagine that it'll kind of be the work of the you know, next year and a half, two, two years of, of, uh, of reading and writing to kind of explore some of these ideas further and um, really get at, because I'm, I'm really interested in the internal act um, but the nature of, of these two things and, and some of the gray area in between them is, is interesting and in need of exploration. So I thank you for the question. Yeah, I, I can jump in here. So um, <clears throat> I, I don't know that I have a good answer to the question of what kind of tests could the court adopt to really uh, properly uh, weigh the perspective of religious claimants and, and the religious interests. I think what I could do is offer some thoughts and maybe some clarity about what the problem is. 
um, and the challenges the court faces in crafting such a rule. Um, one, of it, one part of it is just a question of institutional competency. Uh, these kind of debates are just not, courts are just not well suited to kind of regulate these kind of public policy decisions. Um, one of the things that's been troubling about these cases, except for the most recent one um, that was just decided this month, was that they were all decided in uh, emergency postures without full briefing, without evidentiary hearings. And so the court really was just kind of inserting itself in this field of public health, uh, with very sparse evidentiary records, right? And so, so what are you really basing the decision on? I think the bigger problem though, um, <clears throat> for kind of answering that question about how do you really uh, respect the perspective of the religious claimants is the doctrinal knot that the court has gotten itself into in the last 30 years is it tries to undermine but not overrule the Smith decision. Um, and my thinking here is partly influenced, uh, Professor Caveney, by the article you published last year on the new religious liberty litigation, right? Because even, uh, so this question, there are people who are pushing the court to overrule Smith, and then there's question of what do you replace it with? Some people suggest going back to something like Sherbert. Um, some people suggest something different, but it's difficult because it, uh, it's not really much given the contortions in the doctrine that have happened since Smith, it's actually hard to imagine going back to Sherber uh, because if you pointed out, right, the, the court is going to defer to the religious claimant about whether or not uh, any policy is a substantial burden on their sincere, sincere religious views. The court is then going to defer to the government about whether there's a compelling government interest to justify the policy. So all that's really left is this question of narrow ta tailoring. What I've tried to draw in this paper is to say that, you know, there's not even much left of that. If all the claimant has to do is point to an example of an exemption, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the case of the Muslim police officer was an easy one because it was a very narrow rule that affected only a few people <clears throat> with only a couple of religious claimants. But that's not generally how this type of litigation works. And so like zoning is a good example of where else this comes up, um, where churches are seeking variances and exemptions from rules about parking spaces and being in commercial areas. Um, <clears throat> but zoning law is, you know, a complex regulatory field with decades upon decades of regulation overlapping. Um, and so, it, so if all you have is narrow tailoring um, and there's not even much left of that. It's hard to know how the court uh, can give more deference or at least more uh, pay more respect to the interests of religion without either completely undermining the regulatory framework um, or without having to make kind of arbitrary distinctions between different religious claims and between, between different types of religious claimants. Because you can always put on a pair of spanks and get it more narrowly tailored, right? You know? All right, that's a girl joke, sorry. Uh, I can jump in here. Um, thank you, Professor Caveney, for your remarks. And I think that's an important question, right, of pluralism and how to, how, to, how, how can we talk about the, what I talked about in terms of the pluralistic aspect. And the way I see it, um, the way I see it is seen through approximate ends and remote ends at the, um, where the proximate end, because the original intent of writing this paper was to respond to people like Sean Floyd about what do we mean when, when Christians go against this, out um, against public health measures and then inadvertently spreading a virus to their neighbor. So this is a love thy neighbor kind of situation here. So the proximate end is behaving, right? Like you said, with the remote end being the common good. So the proximate end trying to specify the action here. Um, and then the remote end trying to universalize, um, to universalize this whole aspect here of, um, uh, of what I mentioned with Bart. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know if that really gets into your question. Um, I mean, I, I don't deal much with law. I deal more with theology, but I, I just wanted to add that there. No, it's always good to bring law to theology to law because, you know, what, what I tried to do in my setup of the, of the case, um, there is a, a worldview. I mean, when, when, when somebody like Robert says, Oh, well, you know, I'm just calling balls and strikes. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not making any judgments here. You know, don't go in, you know, nothing to see here, folks. Just keep going. That, that's wrong. I mean, there's a whole worldview behind this that animates the judgments. And I think what you've done is bring out some of that as well. So thank you. Thank you. Just briefly, um, I think temporal care and spiritual care are connected. Um, at the hip, 
you know, you can't, that while as people of faith, we know that uh, the sacraments, the spiritual life is a necessary component of our temporal life. It shapes the way we live, how we relate with the world around us. With that being said, uh, I think there's a certain disconnect between sacramental life as we know it and the necessary restrictions that have come about as a result of the pandemic. With that being said, I, I might be wrong here, but I don't think that the court should consider this when they're making rulings on emergency public health orders. Um, because there, there are certain psychological impacts, uh, impacts to the practice of religion uh, that come from these orders, but they're temporary. I don't see a negative long lasting impact on it once the pandemic fades away. That's very helpful. Well, thanks again to Leonardo and to Anthony and to Danny and to Christoph and especially to Dr. Caveney for her response. I appreciate all your, your insight and uh, the papers presented in the responses. Um, we have just a few minutes before the concluding remarks and the award to the uh, best student paper uh, announcement. So we invite you to, to uh, jump on over to that Zoom link and uh, thank you again for your participation today. And we'll Lisa, could you send me the Zoom link to the award ceremony again? I, that would